Okay, what I'd like to talk about today is uh, some of the sources of physical complexity in rivers and how they're formed and how they're why their presence is important and what happens if you lose that complexity. So this first lecture is the importance of physical complexity in river ecosystems. And basic objectives that I, I hope you'll get out of this lecture are to understand rivers as ecosystems rather than as simple conduits, say for water and sediment moving downstream, and to understand what creates physical complexity in rivers. Uh, why does it matter if they're different or similar to simple physical conduits? And understand some of the implications of that physical complexity. So a little bit of background. Uh, why are rivers important? Why do people pay attention to rivers and care about rivers and spend a lot of time and energy trying to manage rivers? First of all, they provide a lot of what are known as ecosystem services. And examples for rivers are clean drinking water, fisheries, whether for recreational or commercial potential, flood control, and habitat for a wide variety of plants and animals that live both in rivers and in valley bottoms. So ecosystem services usually refers to things that we as humans uh, depend on but may not be that aware of that are provided by naturally functioning ecosystems. Rivers also are very important in terms of biodiversity. There are species of plants and animals that live within the channel that I'll refer to in this lecture as aquatic organisms, and then there are those that live in the floodplain adjacent to the channel that I'll call riparian. And there are lots of studies that show in a wide variety of environments, from mountains to desert areas to the tropics, that there's a much higher diversity of plants and animals in rivers and in the valley bottoms adjacent to them than there are in most of the uplands. Rivers are also very important in terms of nutrient dynamics, and the primary nutrients that get a lot of attention are carbon and nitrogen, and nutrients in this context, this refers to uh, material that is vital to most living organisms, so pretty much all plants and animals need some level of carbon and nitrogen, and the way rivers function and how they transport or store carbon and nitrogen is a very important control on the availability of those nutrients both locally and at the global scale, as we'll talk a little bit more later in this lecture. And I'm going to focus particularly on headwater rivers. So you can ask the question, why are headwater rivers important? Headwater rivers in this context are the small channels that don't have many, if any, other channels tributary to them. And although they're very small, some of these are things that you can easily jump across, when you start looking at the total length of rivers in a drainage network, whether that's a fairly small network that's local or something like the Amazon, the world's biggest river, something like 70 to 80 percent of the total length of channels in a network is composed of those headwater rivers. So they're a very important component of any drainage network. They're also very closely linked to the adjacent uplands or the terrestrial environment. So anything that comes into the river network, water, sediment, nutrients, a variety of contaminants, many, much of that material comes in on these little first order rivers, uh, that are, or the headwaters. And those smaller rivers also are very responsive to changes. So if the amount of water or sediment coming in is changed for some reason, whether it's associated with human activities or some natural change, the small headwater rivers are likely to respond to that. As you go downstream in a river network, typically the valley bottom gets wider, you get more well-developed floodplains, and those are buffers. And when you have a large amount of water coming through, say during a flood, some of that water is likely to go out of the channel and across the adjacent valley bottom, so it moves more slowly through there. The, the flood peak, the highest point in the discharge, is attenuated or stretched out over time. And similarly, if you add sediment to a river, some of that sediment is likely to go out of the channel banks and, and or overbank and be deposited on the floodplain. But these very small headwater rivers don't have much in the way of floodplains. They're typically in steeper, narrower valleys, so they lack some of that buffering of floodplains, and again, because of that, they're much more responsive to change. Headwater rivers are also important in increasing the biodiversity of the river network, the, the characteristic I was talking about a moment ago, the diversity of, of species that live in the network. Headwater rivers can have very different physical environments than big rivers. They can have areas with shallow water or warmer water, for example, and that's important for both the younger stage of certain organisms like fish. Very small-bodied fish can take refuge in those shallow waters and predators can't get to them. 
And there are a variety of plants and insects and other aquatic and riparian species that only live in headwaters. So they really increase the diversity of the river network as a whole. Headwater rivers are also fairly important because despite the fact that they perform all these functions, they don't really have the legal protection that we have for larger rivers. In the United States, a lot of the legal protection for rivers is governed by whether or not they're navigable. And very small rivers, particularly the ones you can jump over, are not navigable. So they don't necessarily have the same level of protection uh, for clean water, for example, or for limiting the alteration of the channel form. And that's something that uh, some people are trying to change, but for now, some of those headwater rivers are kind of vulnerable and exposed legally. The other thing I want to provide by way of background is this idea of rivers as ecosystems. Now the simplest view, if you're looking at the physical function of rivers, it's just a conduit that water and sediment move downstream. But if you start thinking of rivers as ecosystems that support plants and animals, they become more than physical conduits. And one way to think about this is what I call the six degrees of connection. So if you look at any river as a whole or any segment of a river, it's actually very closely connected to the greater environment. And this slide sort of illustrates that. It's a picture of a river, but you start thinking about what moves into and along that river. You can have not only the downstream movement of water, sediment, organisms, you can also have upstream movement by organisms. Think about a sal salmonid fish or salmon, for example, coming upstream to spawn. You can have a lateral connection between the floodplain and the channel. During high flows, water, sediment, nutrients, and organisms are moving out of the channel into the adjacent valley bottom. And as the flood peak recedes, they're moving back into the channel. So there's a lot of exchange that way. You can have exchanges between flow in the channel and the shallow subsurface that's known as the hyperreic zone. That's mostly water, sediment, and material that's dissolved in the water. But there are also some aquatic insects that move back and forth between the surface flow and that shallow subsurface. You can have a variety of things coming from the adjacent uplands into the channel, both at the surface and at the subsurface and groundwater. So that variety can be water, sediment, solids in the water, uh, sometimes uh, contaminants, different organisms. So there's sort of two other levels of lateral connection. And then there's a vertical connection between the channel and the atmosphere. And the obvious version of that is rain or snow falling directly on the channel. But you can also have dry deposition of wind-blown silt, for example, or of a variety of chemical constituents like nitrates or mercury. You can have things volatilizing from the water and going back into the atmosphere. You can have aquatic insects that emerge into the atmosphere. So there's a vertical connection both into the subsurface with the hyperreic zone and the groundwater, but also a vertical connection into the atmosphere. So if you keep in mind these six degrees of connection, it, you can't effectively treat any river segment in isolation. It is very much associated with the greater environment, and sometimes that greater environment is the whole world. Uh, as an example, this photo that you're looking at is from the western side of Rocky Mountain National Park. So it's the headwaters of the Colorado River. And there's have been some studies in recent years indicating that the snowpack in this catchment is melting more rapidly because of airborne dust that settles on the snow, makes it darker, makes it melt faster. Some of that dust comes from the states just to the west of us, like Utah or the Great Basin. Some of it's coming all the way from the deserts of Central Asia. So it's going all the way across the Pacific Ocean. So if you start thinking about it that way, then these river ecosystems are connected to the world as a whole. Another component of thinking about rivers as ecosystems is, of course, the plants and animals that live in the, the system. So if we focus on that word system for a moment, uh, the river would be the channel itself, but also the adjacent floodplain environment. Those two basic components of the river environment would be habitat for both aquatic and riparian organisms, again, the plants and animals that live in the channel and in the adjacent valley bottom. And the physical characteristics of the channel and floodplain would govern things like the abundance of habitat, for those aquatic and riparian organisms, and the diversity of habitat. The physical characteristics also influence the disturbance regime. And disturbance regime in this context refers to natural processes or human processes that really alter the, f the habitat. So for example, in a river, big flood, uh, drought, when you have very low flow or very warm water temperatures, something that changes the sediment coming into the catchment, so it could be a wildfire or uh, 
clearance such as timber harvest, the types and the frequency and magnitude of those disturbances through time are what compose the disturbance regime that I've got listed here. So all of those things, the channel and floodplain environments, aquatic and riparian organisms, the physical characteristics combine to govern aquatic and riparian communities. And you could define those phrases as the abundance of organisms, so how many particular fish or cottonwood trees are there, and then the diversity of both species of plants and animals, but also the diversity of individuals. So if you have a particular species, are they all adult organisms or are there juveniles at different stages of development? A lot of times ecologists will assess the health of a community based on the diversity of age structure. So if you were looking at cottonwood trees along a river, if they're all mature trees that are getting close to the end of their lifespan, that suggests that uh, they're not going to be replaced if there's no seedlings that are germinating. So ideally a healthy community has both a diversity of species and a diversity of ages of individuals within each species. And one of the key things with rivers is that I started with that unidirectional arrow and just made it bidirectional because the characteristics of the plants and animals present also influence the physical characteristics of the river. As an example, if you have cottonwood trees growing along the river, or particularly a, a dense thicket of cottonwood seedlings, they're creating frictional resistance along the banks, so when floodwaters go out of the channel and across the floodplain, they move more slowly through that riparian vegetation. The roots of that riparian vegetation are also helping to stabilize the stream banks and limit erosion. So there's a feedback that goes in both directions between these biological communities and the physical characteristics, and that's inherent to many ecosystems. So I'm emphasizing it here to make this point that rivers are most effectively viewed, I think, as ecosystems rather than as simple physical conduits. Other components that are important in understanding rivers as ecosystems. First is this idea of complexity. And this can be spatial complexity as you go downstream along the river. Are there bends? Are there uh, pools and riffles? Are there changes in the cross-sectional geometry or the grain size on the bed? Also variations through time. Most natural ecosystems have some disturbance regimes. So you've got high flows, low flows, variations in the sediment coming in. The other component of complexity is the idea that you have what's called a nonlinear system. And that just means that for a given input, such as water coming in, you can't necessarily exactly predict the response of the river. It's going to depend very much on site-specific conditions. And as an example of this, I'm going to go through a scenario from some of my own research on mountain headwater rivers in Colorado. So if you have a tree growing in the valley bottom and it falls over into the channel, some of those trees that are growing on the bank have a portion of the, the tree trunk that's still resting above the bank. Often it's still partially attached by a root rod, and that's referred to as a ramped piece. Those ramped pieces are more stable than something that's completely in the channel. It's hard for the stream flow to move them and transport them downstream. So they sit there as an obstacle to other wood that's coming down the channel, and they can form a log jam. And the effects of that log jam depend very much on where it occurs. So got this described on the slide as a threshold that's based on valley geometry. On one side of this threshold, if that log jam occurs in a very steep, narrow valley that doesn't have much of a floodplain, as you can see in the photo, you get a step that forms and there's a little bit of backwater upstream of that step. But the backwater doesn't extend very far upstream, maybe one or two times the average channel width. When a big flood comes along, the water depth increases pretty quickly upstream from that log jam, and the force exerted by that water increases quickly. So the jam is probably a fairly transient feature. It may last for only a few years. It's got a, a very limited effect. If you're on the other side of this threshold, in a wide, shallow valley, you get the same log jam forming, but now when a larger flood comes along, there's this floodplain on either side of the channel. So the floodwaters go over bank, and the, the floodplain kind of acts as a safety valve. As I mentioned before, they slow down, they've got shallower flow, they're of lower velocity, uh, but as they're going over bank, they can locally erode the bank. That flow across the floodplain can concentrate in slight depressions and create secondary channels. So you have this pattern of channels that branch and rejoin, and you have kind of a complex channel plan form, or what you see in you when you look at map view. Each of those secondary channels can have bank erosion, so you can be 
causing other trees to fall into the channel, forming more log jams on the secondary channel. And what I'm illustrating in the upper part of this diagram is this self-enhancing feedback where the log jam in the lower gradient section creates this complex channel pattern with more wood recruitment, more log jams that further forces over bank flow. So the reason I use this to illustrate nonlinear effects is that that initial log jam, even if it's the same size, can have very different effects depending on the channel and valley geometry in which it forms. So with that, by way of background, if we think about rivers as ecosystems, one of the inherent characteristics of many ecosystems is that they have both physical and biological complexity. And I want to focus for the rest of this lecture on what creates physical complexity in rivers. So the very first level, you can have complexity in the stream bed. As you move across the channel or you go downstream, there's different grain sizes. Maybe you have areas where there's uh, finer sand and other places where there's cobbles or boulders. So there's complexity in the sediment. There's complexity associated with bed forms. As you go down a river, you may alternate between pools and riffles, or if it's a steeper channel, you may have vertical steps and pools below them. There's also complexity of the stream bed associated with wood in the channel. If it's in a forested environment, you can have individual logs or the log jams that I was just talking about. Each of those create heterogeneity, and maybe another word for complexity in this context is heterogeneity. You don't just have a consistent uniform channel with no variation as you go downstream or through time. So the bed is one source of that. The stream banks are another source. You know, you, if you, most natural channels are not a completely uniform conduit with very straight banks. There are irregularities associated with things like meander bends. There are smaller scale irregularities um, where there's little embayments or protrusions in the bank associated with differences in the size of sediment forming the banks or where trees are growing or have fallen in. There's complexity or heterogeneity associated with cross-sectional form. If you think of pools and ripples, Riffles are typically wider, shallower cross-sections. Pools are often deep and narrow. So as flow goes down through those complex changes in cross-sectional form, you get differences in depth and velocity. And finally, there's differences in the plan form. And again, that's what you see when you look down, say, in an aerial photo or in a map view of a channel. The plan form can be straight or it can be sinuous. You can have a single channel and you can have multiple channels that branch and rejoin as in a braided river. So all of these sources of complexity create heterogeneity in a river. And as an example of, okay, what does it matter if, they're, if it's heterogeneous? This is a picture of a headwater river, again, in Rocky Mountain National Park. What you're looking at is a big log jam that spans the channel. There's a backwater associated with that, and if you can see in the foreground, there's fairly fine sediment and a lot of organic material in that channel. Upstream and downstream of this point, there's mostly cobble to boulder size sediment. So you've created heterogeneity in bed sediments. There's differences in the velocity and the depth of the flow. If you can see the darker water immediately upstream from the log jam, that's deeper and lower velocity. And the yellow arrows are indicating three different channels that branch off from this big obstacle in the main channel. They go across the floodplain and eventually downstream they rejoin, but this one source of initial complexity in the form of a log jam has created heterogeneity and variability in all these other factors such as substrate, uh, flow depth, velocity, and the channel plan form. You can compare that last photo to this one. This is also a natural channel in Rocky Mountain National Park and this one has different sources of complexity. It's a single channel, it's actually a fairly uniform width but you notice there's a series of vertical steps with plunging flow over them, so there's heterogeneity of the bed forms. Even though it's a fairly consistent width, the yellow oval that just appeared indicates a little area on the margins where you're going to have lower velocity, there'll be some finer sediment settling out, so you'll have sand and gravel there, as opposed to the big boulders that are in the center of the channel. So there are a variety of different sources of physical complexity in natural rivers and headwaters. Okay, so why is that important? What are the implications? Well, first of all, if you've got differences in things like grain size in the bed, velocity, uh, flow depth, that creates more diverse habitat and typically more abundant habitat for uh, aquatic organisms such as insects or the really small ones like microbes and bacteria, fish. And then if you look at the whole valley bottom, you also have more abundance and diversity across the floodplain. Here's another example. This is an underwater photo that I took just upstream from a log jam in Rocky Mountain National Park. The orange arrow is indicating the flow direction. 
the log jam is to the left in this view. Most of the stream away from this log jam is has uh, very large boulders in the bed. Uh, you can see one on the left foreground there. Do you notice what's accumulating upstream from the log jam is this finer sand to gravel size material. This is a really uh, pretty diverse habitat for aquatic insects and fish. You can see there's places that are uh, the wood is exposed and there are specific types of microbes and aquatic insects that actually like to eat wood. Um, mainly they're going after the algae that grows on the wood. There's also cover for fish in the form of that log that's sticking above the water surface. And there's a variety of different um, flow depths and velocities here. Another example also from the log jam, again the log jam is to the left, there's a big boulder that's forming the dark object at the back and you can see some bubbles from water that's plunging over that big boulder and the surface of the water shows up as kind of silvery in this photo because there's so many air bubbles on it, the water's being aerated. And again you can see the diversity of substrate, there's sand and gravel in the foreground, big boulders in the middle part, wood at the back and you can just see the silhouette of a trout that is appreciating the abundance and diversity of habitat here. So one implication is that you provide more habitat for aquatic and riparian organisms. Another implication is that physical complexity influences sensitivity and resilience. So sensitivity is defined as the degree to which an ecosystem or a river, in this example, responds to disturbance. So if there's a big flood, does the channel change a lot or is it so if it's formed in bedrock and there's no sediment, maybe not much happens. Resilience is defined as the time frame over which the ecosystem returns to its original condition prior to disturbance. So for example, if you have that big flood and there's a lot of erosion in the channel, the banks get wider, the bed is eroded, does it stay that way? Or if it's a resilient system, typically the channel will return to its original condition over a period of maybe weeks or months or maybe even years following the flood. And the degree to which a system is sensitive in some respects isn't as important as the degree to which it's resilient. Because if it does change in response to the disturbance, the big question is whether it returns to its original condition. So I've got this list on this slide that looks like the uh, so it sounds sort of biblical, fire, flood, and drought, but those are all forms of disturbance in rivers, and the physical complexity of river, a river determines how sensitive it is to each of those disturbances and how quickly it returns to initial conditions. And the high flows or low flows of floods and droughts or the large amounts of sediment coming in associated with a wildfire, excuse me, can change naturally where they can be changed as a result of human activities. We're using resources uh, such as having timber harvest in the catchment or extracting water from the channel, or we're indirectly causing change uh, through warming climate. But as an example of, of how this works, this photo is uh, along Upper North St. Rain Creek in Rocky Mountain National Park, and it's what ecologists call a beaver meadow. It's a portion of wide valley bottom. There's lots of beaver dams in there. Those are creating areas of ponded water that you can see in, in many branching and rejoining channels. So it's a very wet meadow. If, and I should emphasize that there's a lot of physical complexity associated with that. There's flowing water, there's ponded water, there's deep and shallow water, um, willow thickets. If you remove that primary source of physical complexity, which is the beavers and their dams, then you lose a lot of the um, retention that's associated with those beaver dams. You lose some of the overbank floods. Typically the water table declines with time. So you go to a drier meadow environment. And this photo is an example of a place where that's happened. This is Upper Moraine Park in Rocky Mountain National Park. Just a few decades ago, there were a lot of beavers and beaver dams here, and it was a very wet meadow, but the beavers have disappeared, the dams have fallen into disrepair, so now it's become this dry grassland. And what you're seeing in this photo is an area that burned in 2012. It was a fire that was started by an illegal campfire. It was in October of 2012, and it burned Moraine Park. And if the beaver dams and that wet valley bottom had been there, that system would have been more resili resilient. It would have been too wet to burn. So if you, sometimes if you remove sources of physical complexity, you increase the sensitivity of the system to disturbances, in this case the fire, and you decrease the resilience. It's going to take a long time for some of the riparian vegetation to regrow here because now it's a much drier environment than it was historically. So that's another implication of physical complexity in rivers. The third one 
is this idea of retention or storage that I mentioned a moment ago. The more complex, physically complex a river is, the more slowly everything moves downstream, like water during a flood because it's going in the floodplain or it's stored by log jams or beaver dams. Sediment, nutrients, contaminants, whatever is moving downstream is going to move more slowly in a very complex system than in a very simple uniform conduit. So the photo here is a log jam, the orange arrow is indicating flow direction. Again, you can see a lot of sand stored upstream from that log jam. There's also a lot of fine organic material there, twigs, pine needles, pine cones. In most of these mountain rivers, if you don't have something like a log jam, all of that material stays in transport and it moves downstream really fast. And the importance of retaining it is that if you store something like pine needles, even for a few hours during a flood, then the biotic community can start to use those nutrients. So microbes and bacteria and aquatic insects can start to ingest that, those pine needles, and convert them into their tissues, which can then be eaten by fish or by some of the birds that eat aquatic insects. So complexity is really important in creating different levels of retention. If, you know, if the same sediment goes into the floodplain, it might be there for several thousand years. That's what I mean by different levels of retention. You can have retention that's minutes to hours, or you can have retention that's much longer, but even the short retention is important for allowing opportunities for stream organisms to start using that material. So that's a little bit of an overview of what creates physical complexity in rivers and why it's important, and these are a few of the references that I cited uh, during the course of the talk. Thank you.